Cool. Can you see the slides? Yes, I can. All right, we're back um, after a week off because I was out of town and I didn't want to do uh, anything remote. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, pretty good weekend, pretty good everything. Yeah, what'd you do on your weekend off? You didn't have to work at the podcast factory. I went on the quintessential white people activity. I went apple picking. Mid- that's a Midwest vibe. Midwest vibes are apple picking. Oh yeah, big Midwest Midwest vibes. Y'all would but, not uh, understand. Um, I apologize because this episode was supposed to be on California state water projects, but in order to talk about that, you need to know about the Colorado River because without it, like forty million people would die of thirst. Yeah, there's not a lot of water in Middle America, and. It's very hard to come by when there is. Yeah, so that's why the Colorado River is so important and such an anomaly. But first, we got some news. And our news is the National Weather Service sent this, like, really weirdo tweet. Um, this This was a few days ago. But basically, it's been confirmed beyond a reasonable doubt that we will be experiencing a La Nina winter here in the States. So... Back from our last episode when we talked about the California wet season, a La Nina wet season, basically means that you have wetter conditions in the Pacific Northwest um, and less wet conditions in California and the Southwest. Um, Here in uh, Chirac, for us, that's going to mean a wet winter, but a less cold winter. So El Nino winters generally for the Midwest mean we get shit like polar vortexes. Um, that caused gasoline to freeze in people's cars. Oh, God, I forgot about that. Yeah, that was 2019. 2019 was the last uh, El Nino year. But what that means is how they figure that out is up here in the uh, northern Pacific, sorry, northeastern Pacific, if it's if the water gets cold around this time of year instead of gets warm, um, that means that you're going to get some, the jet stream is going to go north, so it's going to be wet in the Pacific Northwest. So what that means for California is that the northern Sierra Nevada and Mount Shasta is going to get pretty wet. So that means the northern Central Valley should get some nice water for next summer, but the southern Central Valley, not so much. And also, the headwaters of the Colorado River up here, I'm going to turn on the laser pointer, will... Uh, the Rocky Mountains are going to get less snowpack than usual this year, meaning drier Colorado River. Uh-huh. But first, yep. but first, let's talk about what what what's Colorado? Took the words right out of my mouth. What is a Colorado? Yeah, what is it? It's a state. It's, it's a state of mind. Who lives there? Importantly. Coloradans, Coloradonians. Okay. Um, many different types. Colorado, it's it's a weirdo place, you know. You got like the literal flat fuck of the Midwest, and then actual mountains, and then Denver, where the but where the two meet into a suburban hellscape. I fucking hate Denver. Yeah, it's um. I I have I've never been but it is kind of the mecca for questionably financial startups that are almost definitely just investors who are willing to lose a lot of money on the off chance it explodes and makes them billionaires. See, I was just startup. So I was just uh, getting that vibe from like suburban hellscape. And then like the worst part being you know, I think I've gone on this tangent before, but I-70, where every white person in an SUV gets in, like, a terrible accident and kills everyone. Um, moving on. So this is the Colorado River. Um, it has a big-ass watershed that basically expands the entire Midwest. Sorry, not Midwest, Southwest. Um, and if you look at cities near the Colorado River here, there's some big names. There's Phoenix, which we don't talk about. There's Los Angeles, San Diego, Tijuana, Mexicali. So some pretty big cities that depend on water from the Colorado River. All told, about 40 million people, 40 million people in the United States um, depend on water from the Colorado River to drink. 
incredibly large amount and in a very large region where there's not many other alternative sources. Yeah, you're pretty vulnerable to a biological attack, but in the in the more, you know, realistic sense, you're vulnerable to drought. So it starts here in the Rocky Mountains, about 10,000 feet above sea level, and then ends here in the Gulf of California, but not really because very few water, actually, if at all, water actually reaches the, the uh, Cal Gulf of California because over 100% of the flow of the Colorado River is allocated to over not. 100? Over 100. Hmm. So the Colorado River is, in fact, a deficit river. Um, meaning that the Colorado River, it's the Colorado River's fault for being for not supplying enough water. So are you are you implying that by how do I describe it? We deliberately make policies that involve more water than the Colorado River outputs? Well, not exactly, and we'll get into that. The reason is um, back when these water rights were drawn up in the early 1900s, they allocated more water than they knew it was going to produce. It was based upon 30 years of research and water data, which were the, upon like further analysis of tree rings and soil samples and everything else, were the 30 wettest years in the last 2,000 years. Oh, I see. Yeah. So <laughs> the definition of 100% is what changed. Yeah. But the numbers, they stayed the same. And then who gets the who gets the first crack at the water? We'll get into that. Yeah. But the terrain. So you have some super varied terrain which the Colorado River goes through. So it starts here, you know, in the Rocky Mountains. It's nice and green. And then goes through canyons like the Grand Canyon, Moab, and then ends here in the Gulf of California. So you get this kind of alluvial that's not what it's called. So you know how in Into the Wild, Chris McCandless couldn't find his way to the Gulf of California? <laughs> That's why. I do. It's because the, Mex the, like, the farmland near Mexicali in Mexico basically turns the Colorado River into irrigation ditches that don't go anywhere. Um, and then only when there's a big flood does it actually reach the, the Gulf of California. So... Um, what was it, 90, 91, 92, uh, that Chris McCandless couldn't find his way to the Gulf of California? That makes sense. Those were fairly dry, but anyway. Yeah. So the Colorado River, the basin has a long history of messing up civilizations, um, namely the Native Americans. So these are Native American reservations near the Colorado River, obviously absolutely no resemblance to the land that they once occupied <laughs> but yeah. a lot of native american uh tribes back before uh christopher columbus sailed the ocean blue with his smallpox uh were settled along the colorado river because the soil was super fertile from uh, silt wash and there was water so you could farm and the reason why all these civilizations didn't survive or they moved out is because of droughts like this one here and this one here and this one here that basically because of their overuse of the soil and the lack of water created a dust bowl and forced them to move out which is kind of ominous yeah. seeing where we are today cultures of, yeah cultures of the time were very often known for moving into an area, living in it until the soil got depleted or the animals were hunted out or the water ran with phosphorus and other leached out topsoil nutrients. Well, that's not good. And then they moved. They yeah. They moved to a different spot and rinsed and repeated. Yeah, but you can't convince people in Phoenix, Arizona to leave because they chose that hellhole to live in and they're not leaving. Yep. And that's how we end up with Phoenix. Yeah, so this is just kind of a bit more information about what I was talking about. So in 1922, so basically Nevada, California, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, they signed the Colorado River Compact. Uh, it divided half the river's flow 
uh, to the upper basin. So that's from uh, so that's basically everything up here. Upper basin, lower basin. It's not that complicated. And each was given rights to 7.5 million acre feet of water per year. And that was a figure believed to represent half of the river's minimum flow at Lee's Ferry. Lee's Ferry is the output of Lake Powell, which we'll get into, and that's when the Colorado River starts becoming actually significant. And then this was followed by the U.S.-Mexico Treaty in 1954, which allocated only 1.5 million acre feet of the Colorado River to Mexico. And then Arizona didn't ratify the Colorado River Compact because it feared California would take too much of their lower basement allotment, which they did. Uh, they reached a compromise uh, that allowed Arizona to get uh, in like a firm allocation of 2.8 million acre feet a year. But this is only if California um, had 4.4 million acre feet uh, during drought years. So these and some other compacts and a bunch of different crap basically make what's now known as the law of the river. So that's a bit of our stuff which is to come. So as we take a look at some infrastructure along the Colorado River, here's some points of interest. So there's Lake Powell, there's Lake Mead, there's Parker Dam, and then there's Imperial Dam near Mexico. So it's worth mentioning that all of these things are man-made, and the Colorado River is known to be a river of extremes before people came along and controlled it. It would have insane flooding every year, basically farmland Farming as it exists today would not be able to exist in the untamed Colorado River just because of how much it floods every year with no regulation, and you can't do anything about it. But you can, because we have Lake Powell. So Lake Powell is the first link along the chain of a lot of infrastructure, and the Glen Canyon Dam controls it. Here it is. Uh, in satellite context, it's north. It's northeast of Las Vegas and the Hoover Dam. Not too much to say about it, except I found this graph. So this is the um, water level in Lake Powell for the last five years. Each line is one year. And then this gear goes through the year. So obviously it's going to go down as the year goes on with some exceptions. But look at 2021. It's a little hmm. purple line at the bottom. Yeah, that's, that's not so good. You know, it's much lower than anything else it's been in the last five years. Mostly because this last year was such a bad uh, La Nina year that basically there was no snowpack in Colorado. I mean, there was, just wasn't much. So it seems like around, uh, what is that, April or May is when the snowpack starts melting? <laughs> Yeah, so snowpack high up in the mountains generally doesn't melt as soon as winter ends. It melts throughout the uh, spring and early summer. And then late summer uh, through fall, like now, you don't really have much snowpack at all. You're just relying on the water you already have in the reservoir. Oh, yeah. So uh, in 2019, you see that uh, the big ramp up? Yep. So what do you think is going on there? 2019 was an El Nino year, so Colorado got a lot more snowpack than usual. So the snowmelt was a lot more. Because 2018, wow. you were coming off of a dry year already. Um, which line's 2018? Yeah, this red one here. This red line was 2018 here, so if you pick up where it left off back here. I see. Down, 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 then up. So anyway... You go to Lake Mead. Lake Mead is more well known because one, it's right next to Las Vegas. So once you, if so, if you want to go to Las Vegas with your little uh, children and you don't want to sound like a shitty parent, you go to Hoover Dam. But so Lake, so Hoover Dam is named after the worst president in history, who caused the Great Depression, and it was named uh, Hoover Dam kind of by accident because like some dude like went rogue during like the does it like the what the fuck is it called like the speech where you say this thing exists like the opening speech mm. and he just kind of said it was called hoover dam huh. 
but and then people just ran with it. Yeah. So even though it was basically FDR who made the whole thing possible. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so FDR's diet socialism, but this was a result of the Colorado River Compact. So this basically makes all of the land downstream on the Colorado River inhabitable because it controls the yearly floods. And once the Colorado River Compact was drafted in the 20s, again, this is what we talked about. It based it on 30 years of stream flow records that suggested an annual flow of 17.5 million acre feet. Modern studies of tree rings revealed that those three decades were probably the wettest in the past 1,200 to 2,000 years. And that the long term average is probably closer to about 13.5 million acre feet. So that's a 5 million acre foot difference. So, sorry, 4 million. So, this resulted in more water being allocated to rivers uh, that flow through Colorado than actually throw through Colorado. And droughts have made this worse. In late 2010, Lake Mead dropped to just 8 feet. So, this was the first drought sugar. And this was the level at which Arizona and Nevada would have to begin rationing water, as was agreed through the Colorado River Compact. And then when Lake Powell was – so sorry. this was So when Lake Powell um, raised, raised its water level such that uh, they would be able to continue generating hydroelectric power, this caused Hoover Dam and Lake Mead to drop such that I lost my place in my notes. Uh, such that it passed the emergency drought trigger, which basically caused, um, oh god. Oh, did you lose it again? I did. And basically, I'll go rogue for this. Because okay. California funded most of the infrastructure along the Colorado River, they have senior water rights over uh, Nevada and Arizona. So that means that they would need to have substantial water cuts before California would need to cut anything. I see. And this is just a graph of the water level of Lake Mead through time from 35 when it was constructed to 2010. This graph's a little bit dated, but you know, it's a, it's, it shows where we are. So obviously you have the big spike when it gets filled. And then it's just following droughts throughout the 20th century. And then that builds to your maximum in 1983, which we'll see a video of on the next slide, when Hoover Dam was actually so full that it didn't look like this, which it looks like now. And kind of a bit tangent, this is what it looks like when it was empty. This is what it looks like now. Not too much of a difference. <laughs> oh, did it get really full at some point? Yeah, it got really full in the 80s, coming off of like a weirdo amount of wet seasons. And again, the 20th century was like the wettest century in history. Oh, and yeah. then it's basically just gone down, 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 down ever since. So I have a video from Solar Steve W., this is like his like home movie footage of his trip to Hoover Dam in 1983. Oh shit. Okay. So I'm going to kind of speed through this a little bit. But the Hoover Dam emergency spillway is probably the most eerie thing I've ever seen in my life. Look at that. Oh yeah, that's some um, that that is some um, brutalist architecture vibes. Yeah. And then people are just like coming here to beat the heat. So I'm guessing it was pretty hot. This this scares the crap out of me. This Ooh. is like five stories tall. And then of course these boys at the hydroelectric plant are churning out power. This is what it looked like. This is capacity for Hoover Dam. Just to remind you of what Hoover Dam looks like now. That picture there. Yeah, there's another picture. That's a good quote to end the video with. 
A luxurious yeah. abundance of water unseen today. Unseen today? It is unseen today. Do you see it today? I see it's a retrospect. Yeah. I thought that meant unseen in the day. Oh, shit. And I'm like, no, that's <laughs> day. So going further downstream to the California-Arizona border is Parker Dam. And Parker Dam, it's not, it's, the dam itself isn't terribly important. It's not really holding back a big reservoir. But what is important is that it is the mouth of the uh, Colorado River Aqueduct. And if you were looking for a way to basically make Los Angeles, the whole Los Angeles area uninhabitable, if you blew up the Colorado River Aqueduct and what we'll talk about next week, the uh, California State Water Project, they would have no source of water. Those two uh, aqueducts are literally their only sources of water. Hmm. Let that sink in. <laughs> what does it want now? Yeah. So it's just that. yeah, it's a two hundred forty-two long, um, two hundred forty-two mile long stretch of pipes, canals, tunnels getting water from the Colorado River to Los Angeles, blah, blah, blah. It's not terribly important all the places it goes. Um, but its average pumping is about 1.2 million acre feet. Or 1.5 cubic kilometers. Interesting. Hmm. Thanks for that unit conversion. And then if you go far, like way further down to basically the border of California and Mexico, you have the Imperial Dam. So the Imperial Dam diverts about 90% of the water from uh, the Colorado River and sends about 10% of it to Mexico and 90% of it to California. And these are some, these are some desilting stations which take all that lovely silt from the water and get it out because those make pipes not work good. But the Colorado River is hella silty. Uh, just picks up a lot of topsoil from the bottom or the riverbank. And that's what makes the, uh, the bank so good for farming is because you have that fertile silt coming from upstream. Oh, I see. Mm. So... Then there's what I call the affront to God, which is the Imperial Valley. It's basically a bunch of farmland in the middle of the desert that we use for getting our lovely table grapes in the dead of winter. Hmm. That's, that's basically what it's used for. <laughs> um, so this is the All-American Canal, and that goes from the Imperial Canal, sorry, the Imperial uh, Dam, and it's just this straight-ass um, canal that a lot of people drown in. So it about very surreal. Yeah, about 500 people have drowned in the All American Canal because you know the waters are like really cold. It's deep. Those are some steep sides, um, and it's it's got a fast current. Most of the deaths are from undocumented immigrants crossing the border right here. They need to get across. If they try to get across, it doesn't work. Oh yeah, it um. What's what? You there? You there? I mean that tracks. Did you die? It, it happens. I we did. I didn't hear any of what you just said. Yeah, I've got um, I've got an internet connection unstable on me right now. Uh oh. But uh, I more or less said something along the lines of, you know, it's it kind of functions on the same. Uh, how to describe it? It kind of functions in the same way as a Venus flytrap in the way you think of it, because it's just a situation where you get yourself into it and you don't have the skill to get out of it. And mm -hmm. by the time you do, it's just outright too late. It's too. It's very powerful of a river, you know. Mm -hmm. Very a little, a little bleak, but yeah. I mean, that's the situation. And that supplies, it is the only water source for the Imperial Valley. Um, and what's interesting is before the, um, like, 
where they drain drain the whole thing and then like seal the entire thing. Before that, about 68,000 acre feet was lost annually from seepage through the concrete um, like walls. And about 90% of the seepage entered Mexico. And then at first, this caused widespread f- flooding, but some resourceful people in the Mexicali Valley, um, they built drainage and pumping systems to recover the seepage. And the agriculture became reliant upon it. And then the U.S., you know, they wanted to kind of reduce their losses because there were some droughts going on. They planned to line 23 miles of the canal. It's basically stopping the seepage. So then in 2006, oh. um, some businesses and the civic organization in Mexicali and then two nonprofits in the U.S., um, challenged the lining in federal court on the basis that it violated the water rights of Mexican water users and violated U.S. environmental statutes. Um, that didn't go anywhere, and they resealed it, and there's like not much seepage. But I think it's great that, that Mexico profited off of the wastefulness of the U.S. for some time. Oh, almost everyone profits off the wastefulness of the U.S. This is true. Economically, we're bleeding like a stuck pig. I mean, including us, because we get to make a podcast about climate change. Absolutely. Make money off your misery. So this is this is Mexico's cut. Mexico's cut of the Colorado River is, is fuck all. Um, <laughs> they don't get much water. Again, 90% of the water that would have entered Mexico by the time it gets there is cut off from the Imperial Dam. And it ends up from this, like, in... This is Lake Powell, and at Lake Powell, the river is about 100 feet deep, and then it's like a quarter mile wide. So we'd say it's a big-ass river. And then by the time it gets to Mexico, it's basically a drainage ditch that Uh, captures road runoff, and then only sometimes does the flow actually reach the Gulf of Mexico. Basically, what this development has done is it's destroyed any semblance of an ecosystem existing at this delta and turned the entire thing into farmland. Okay. But, yeah, the Colorado River is hands down probably the most diverted river, like the most industrialized, like, controlled river in the world. We'll get to, the, like, the Nile River and, like, the Yellow River and the, the Yangtze in China at some point. But the Colorado River is definitely the most important one in the U.S. for water. And then this is a slide I like to call uh, another affront to God. Agriculture in Arizona. Oh, my God. Do they really? They, they sure do. So this is kind of a map. Uh, so there's Las Vegas. There's Los Angeles. And there's Tucson somewhere down there, which I like to call the unholy triangle. Because that's where all the farmland's in. So ma- mainly it's only right along the river and it's, a de- and it's only there because the soil is really fertile. And again, because Arizona had California finance most of their water projects, Arizona agreed to have only junior water rights in their own state. And that means if a shortage was ever, was, it, was ever declared, Arizona's supply was vulnerable to cutbacks in excess of 20%. Which happened on August 8th, 2021. Lake Mead fell below basically crisis levels where it could barely generate hydropower. And these farmers downstream had to have 20% cutbacks. So that means they can plant 20% less food and they get 20% less money. They were being subsidized anyways, right? Kinda. they're, They're basically planting grapes. They're, they're, they're not planting corn. They're not planting soy. They're not planting wheat. They're not getting subsidies. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's a shame then. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're planting fruits and vegetables during the winter. Which it will the be a winter. Great day on the death of the agricultural desert. Yes. Which the winter being the driest time because you don't have the snow melt in the Colorado River yet. So it's at its lowest point in the year. So the effects of development, here we are. We've developed the hell out of the Colorado River and we've taken its insanely seasonal, uh, like flood prone and drought prone flow into basically zero. 
at the uh, delta. So this is kind of a little graph that's in, uh, it's written in Spanish. It's a little dated, but it shows the point quite well. 1935, pre-Hoover Dam. Post-1935, everything afterwards. And as you can see, there's a pretty clear distinction when climate change starts taking some hold and lowers the output. That's really all I got to say about the Colorado River. Pretty interesting, actually, to see just incredible spikes being whittled down to tiny stubs and then after 1960 being whittled down to almost nothing. Yeah, it's 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 kind of an interesting story of just like, all of these civilizations formed around the belief that it was always going to be that wet. Uh, the post-World War II uh, climate, you know, you had rapid urbanization of the United States, and it was also super wet, and everyone was like, it's always going to be this wet. And that was before we could look at tree rings, or people were probably looking at tree rings. It was probably before the government cared to listen to people who looked at tree rings. And here we are. We're in a system that has 40 million people living in an area that is now pretty much not going to get any water. It's quite a shame, really. It is. Um, and talking about the La Nina year again, you know, British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon, they're going to have some pretty devastational snow. And then once the snow melts, some flooding. It depends how bad of a La Nina year this is. It's hard to say until it's over, really. So we'll have to see. But the next episode is finally going to be on the Central Valley and California water projects because we now have some context for how the hell Southern California gets its water, which is only from two different ways. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Uh, let's see. Um, for this week, I can't think so. Hmm. All right. So. The only thing I kind of wanted to say is I kind of gave a uh, brief little tidbit to it earlier in the pod, but just kind of talking about the direction we're going to take with this in the future episodes we're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, California, I keep talking about it because it's a really interesting case study for water policy and that it's just so dynamic. And it's so prevalent in how the and how it goes there. So we're gonna be talking about that for a few more episodes, and then just Western droughts in general. Then we're gonna move over to the East Coast and Midwest for a bit, and then a few more miscellaneous, and then we're gonna go on a world tour. Oh, good stuff. Yeah, world tour. We're going. We're going everywhere. But until then. I hope you enjoyed, and yeah, last week was off. We'll have another episode next week. Yep, we will see you then. We will. Okay. Um.